couple things from from my perspective just to kind of you know it's hard to explain what you get from a pilgrimage everybody's got a different thing and what I you know I was going for a few reasons just to get closer to my son you know to get because this is going to be like a a time I'll never get back with my 14 year old and he wanted to go and I thought I got to go if he wanted to go so that was one reason I went and and then uh, just you know I'm I just needed some time away from the world and that when you go on this you're away from the world you're you're away you know you don't hardly look at your phone you don't you don't do anything you know you you're just trying to empty yourself basically and then to think of the sacrifice that father capon did you know that's all that's another you know that's that's why you do it father by the way to pronounce father capon or father capon the families would say father capon but they don't care if, but kansans all say father capon so when you hear them talk up there they all say father capon Except the family, so. Amel, yeah, Amel Capen. Father Amel Capen. Father Amel Capen. So that's, either way, they're not going to throw you out if you call him Father Capon. Somebody called him something else, though, and I, I wanted to correct him, but I didn't. So anyway. Um, so, yeah, so the, Andrew and I went all four days of the, of, we started Thursday and finished on Sunday. Pete, you can start this pilgrimage on day three if you want or day four you can even start and just do the last day if you want a lot of people some people did that um, the first day is 22 miles but in Kansas miles but in Texas miles it's like 27 miles at least that's what that's what my that's what my phone said we went 27 miles it seemed like we kept going but uh, it was it was great the weather was perfect I mean we couldn't ask for anything better um, if, if we if we dialed it up ourselves it was about 80 every day and at night it was about 58 59 degrees so the camping was perfect we set up we uh camped every night uh you can you saw all the tents they're all gathered together um so there were there's it was just there were people from all over the country here at this at this pilgrimage a lot of people from wichita a lot of people from kansas that come every year but there was probably half the people from different parts. There was a group from Maryland. Uh, the, they had a men's group from, from Maryland, like 10 guys, or eight, eight or 10 guys. And they, were, they were, had matching T-shirts the whole time. They were very organized. First time they ever been to the pilgrims. It was great to see them. And um, so I'm going to tell one story. There, you know, when we do the men's conferences for, good, for North Texas Catholic Brothers for Christ, when we're in the leadership role and we're meeting we say if we can have if we can save one person of all this work that we do you know having a, a conference with a thousand men if we can just save one soul it's worth everything we do and so i'll try to explain this story so this this guy worked at a call center he was he was a telemarketer guy and he called people to get them to do certain things in this particular case he was calling people to come do a blood drive okay and so he calls uh, one of the people that were going to come to this um, pilgrimage and he asked him you know you gave blood before would you give blood you know this week we're having a blood drive here in this and it's in Ohio this is Ohio and uh, we're doing a blood drive and the guy said well I can't I'm getting ready to go on a pilgrimage and I need all the blood and all the energy I can muster up and so, and, he, and the guy, the call center guy said, what, what, uh, what do you, what kind of, pil what's a pilgrimage? Where is it at? And like, and so he, uh, he told him, he says, it's, it's about Father Capon. And it's, he t told him a little bit about Father Capon. And anyway, they got off the phone. He didn't do the dr blood drive. And this guy just got off the phone. And anyway, the guy afterwards did some research on Father Capon and, and uh, looked up and about the pilgrimage and and called made a few calls to see if he could go on the pilgrimage he, you know he didn't know why he you know he didn't know why he was going i mean he wasn't a practicing catholic he lived with his girlfriend had just all kinds of you know, just this ordinary guy out of nowhere 
So he, he said, I'm going to go on this pilgrimage. And he did. He, um, he just by faith, because nobody, it was right before the pilgrimage, like a couple days before the pilgrimage, it's hard to get a hold of people. Everybody's busy trying to get everything ready. And he never heard back, so he just showed up in Wichita and basically signed up on the spot. And so this guy didn't have any idea who the guy was about the, the blood drive. Like the guy in the blood drive, he, does, he didn't even, he didn't think about, you know, running up with that guy. Anyway, they met at the, at the, on the walk, became really good friends. And the chances of that happening, like the chances of those guys meeting up at this pilgrimage were unbelievable. Anyway, by the time the pilgrimage was over, um, the guy went to confession, started pro he was going to start practicing his faith. He did a witness, basically, to the whole group about his life, how, you know, how he, he, he's been away from the church. And he's, he, it was just an unbelievable event that, when he said all that. So those are the kind of things that happened at this pilgrimage. There was probably all kinds of other ones. You guys may have some, some, um, some you know, instances of where that happened. So uh, that was awesome. Um, so a lot of prayer. We, we go to Mass every day. We pray, we pray Mass in the morning. And I'll tell one more story, and then I'll let you guys talk. But um, we were, every morning we have Mass, and we, have, we had a, a great priest from Wichita that, that was the chaplain at Father Cap, at, at Capon High, where the Catholic high school, he was the chaplain there. So he did, I think he does this every year. I'm not sure if he does it every year, but he's a young, young priest. But he would do a homily every day. And so one of the things I complained about, about, you know, people complain on this thing because it's not easy. It's not an easy event to walk 25 miles and then, you know, camp and try to find a toilet somewhere, which is another adventure. Uh, but so I was complaining there's no coffee. Like, why isn't there coffee? Like, I just want one cup of coffee. I don't even need anything in the coffee, just coffee. And they, did, they don't make coffee because they don't want us to dehydrate out there. So they don't do coffee. And so the homily that next morning, and I, I'm telling these guys, and they're laughing at me, and they, and they probably want coffee too, but they're not going to complain, which they're really good. Uh, the homily was about, every homily was about Father Capon and whatever things he had to endure in his camp, okay, and, and on the way to the camp, all that. So... He would go clean the prisoners' clothing, underwear, outside after they, you know, that was soiled underwear. Think about that for a second. Would you go clean anybody's underwear besides yours? You know, that's the kind of, that's what he did for these men. And I'm complaining because there's no coffee. I'm going, no more complaints about the coffee. <laughs> I mean, it, what it, he had to endure was unbelievable. And he didn't endure it. He wanted to do it. He would, the thing that I got most out of that walk is that <clears throat> talking about a humble servant of the Lord, like you can't get any more humble than that. Like he, besides Jesus on the cross. I mean, this guy gave it all for his, his soldiers and did all kinds of things like that. More every day we would hear things like that on this pilgrimage. People would be praying the rosary on the pilgrimage, which was great. I got to pray with Andrew every day, uh, rosary, and uh, we. And then you just you'd be walking around, and a group of people would be praying the rosary and just chime in while you're walking. That was cool. Um, mass every day, like I said, you could do reconciliation. The priest would walk with you, and just you could just do a reconciliation while you're walking. I. I didn't make the pilgrimage, the whole thing. I, I, I didn't make the first day. And, and a funny story about it, you find out a lot about your body once you start on, on one of these journeys. Uh, <clears throat> and, and it becomes kind of a virus, right? So when you fail, other people are like, oh gosh, I don't know if I can make it. Well, Rick was like, oh gosh, I don't know. You know, and then Andrew goes, dad, we gotta stick to the plan. And I thought, well, how proud that Andrew would, would just muster up that much energy to say, look, we, the plan is we got to finish it, Dad. And it didn't give him an option. So <laughs> I, felt, I felt pretty bad in that regard. But the, this is run like a chirp. So 
there's a lot of things going on in the background. So, you know, when you do a chirp, your bed's set up. There's a lot of things that happened for people that haven't been to chirp. I apologize. But uh, that happened for, you know, for all these nights. People were moving luggage back and forth. It was backbreaking work. So, in a way, I got to see all that from the back side. Well, so now I'm with this group of men that's helping m muster up all this energy to make things happen behind the scenes. And I get in a, in a car to go deliver ice cream. Somebody had the great idea to deliver ice cream to some people on the way. And I, I said, hey, uh, to the driver, I said, tell me, uh, I want to hear a little bit more about some of the miracles. He goes, oh, well, you're sitting next to, you know, a little boy that had the pole vaulting <coughs> accident and his skull was cracked wide open. So I got to hear the story from the dad and he's sitting right next to me. Well, so I'm with him the whole time and his wife and got to hear all these incredible stories and these miracles firsthand. I mean, I've read about them, but to hear them from them firsthand was uh, really a, a pretty cool experience. Um, so Rick mentioned these guys that came in from, from Maryland, and they, uh, they all had the same shirts on, and it was really clever. They had the Jeep on the front, you know, the hood of the Jeep. Uh, so you get to meet all these people on the pilgrimage because you're just kind of meandering through the line of, of this march. And it's, uh, first, first day is 22 miles. I know Rick said it felt like 25. We felt like we, were, we did the whole walk on the first day. It was pretty brutal. I uh, became interested in Father Capon, um, had, felt a special connection because my father was also uh, a prisoner of war in, in uh, World War II. And uh, the story that was on that video about, um, you know, if you were failing on the, the march to the camp, that, you know, you would just be, killed and my father told me that same story that you know if you um, if you couldn't make it you were just bayoneted you know on the side of the road so when I learned about Father Capon I just kind of felt a special connection to him because of my father uh, so my, my experience wasn't exactly like I envisioned it because I thought oh well, I'm just gonna knock these walks out and just pray and just really enjoy the time and that's not exactly what happened to me uh, I was pretty humbled. I, uh, I didn't get a great start. I uh, didn't hydrate well and was kind of fighting a cold and, um, you know, eight or nine miles in, I was developing some blisters. So I was really, I was really struggling um, that, that, that first day. And uh, in, my, in my head, I was just seeing um, my dad talking to Father Capon in heaven, telling him that Man, I didn't know my son was such a panty waste, you know. <laughs> so and I just, he just kind of repeated on me, you know. So it was really, it was really humbling there. Um, and then uh, I took some notes here. Um, when we uh, arrived at, um, I guess, at Peabody Park, um, like Jim was saying, he was with the volunteer team, and um, yeah, I was, I was pretty broken, and. Uh, Kind of what what happened there was like Jim kind of he he really took care of me actually he got my all my tent and all my my luggage and just brought it to where we were camping and and just magically he appeared with all this lemonade and ice and I, and it was I was so dehydrated and, and it just kind of appeared out out of nowhere and then you know all, all my brothers it's like kind of feels like um you know you're loved when they'll handle your feet right so no, <laughs> You know, Mark applied moleskin. He's probably touched my feet more than my wife has. So, you know, it just, uh, you know, your brothers will, will help you. And it was, it was really meant a, meant a lot to me there. Um, so the, the next day, I was still not 100%, not but they did have nurses uh, on hand that drained your blisters. And they, you know, they, they did all they could to, you know, make you comfortable so you could complete the walk. And um, in my head, I was like, well, I'm just going gonna, gonna to get this done. I'm just going to grind through it. Um, but I did the, the first leg uh, of that day. It was like four and a half miles or so. And I just knew I was gonna, not going to make it. So I thought, well, I'm just going to, they have this thing called the safety wagon. And you could hop in it. And you know, just you would just follow the, the herd. Uh, so I, I did that. And I was kind of disappointed in myself. but. Um, often happens, you know, God, he has plans for you. So he, he put me in that van and I got to meet uh, a gentleman, uh, Matthew Kuchel. And Matthew, um, 
has pre-onset uh, multiple sclerosis. So I got to actually um, talk to him and pray with him. And he was, um, uh, he was doing the pilgrimage for healing. You know, and his faith was amazing. And, um, you know, I, I promised him that, you know, this Saturday that I would uh, uh, pray some intentions for him and that uh, a group of very strong, faith-filled men would, would pray for him. So I wanted to keep that promise. And then um, I also asked Bob to saint the saint, uh, send the St. Therese package to him. And uh, so, you know, if I didn't, if I, wouldn't, if, I ha if I hadn't not felt well, maybe I wouldn't have got to meet Matthew. So, you know, I just kind of took that as just God giving me an opportunity, a, a different blessing. You know, I didn't really anticipate that, but, you know, I'm, I'm grateful, grateful for that. Um, yeah, and then the, the last day was, was great. So I, I kind of recovered, felt good, and that last eight miles was, was really pleasant. It was, you know, very light. A uh, lot of energy in the group. Everybody could see the, the light at the end of the tunnel. Um, I guess just some other highlights. Um, you saw some in the picture. You saw uh, John getting to carry the cross. So it was kind of a, a lead group, kind of young guys. And, you know, John said, I'm going to catch those guys. I'm going to get up, catch up with them. And, and he did. And uh, they let him carry the cross for two miles. And it was... It was really cool. I mean, it might have been one of those things where you had to be there, but that, that cross wasn't, wasn't light. It was awkward, and, and it had heft to it. So to, to heft that, to carry that for, for two miles was, was really cool. You know, I, you know, I kind of teased him. I just called him a Simon Cyrene starter kit, you know, so. Uh, <clears throat> and then, you know, Rick, Rick said the same thing with him and Andrew. Did all 40. Uh, the whole 60 miles, and uh, so they'll have that memory forever. You know, Andrew's going to, he, he might not think about it so much now, but he's going to treasure that, you know, forever. And then uh, on the last day, uh, they asked, they stopped us, you know, kind of outside the church, you know, quarter mile, we all gathered together, and they asked for the, the veterans to go to the front of the line. So Mark is a, a Navy veteran, and you know he 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 led us onto sacred ground. Man, that's how it felt. It, it felt right, and it was like, wow, this is really cool. You know, really cool. So uh, I mean, I didn't have those type of highlights. I got the last Slim Jim uh, one day on one of the rest stops. So <laughs> I was pretty proud of that. But uh, I do encourage everybody to to think about going next year. I th you know I learned a lot, and I think we all learned a lot, and we'd be you know glad to kind of pass those tips on. You know, uh, Rick talked about the group from Maryland. If they can send seven or eight guys, you know, we should be able to double that. So, I mean, kind of get kind of competitive about it. And, you know, I'd, I'd really love to see just like a, a big group of people go. John mentioned uh, <clears throat> carrying the cross. There, there's a little bit of a story behind that. Um, I went on the pilgrimage uh, mainly for my son, Nick, who's in Army aviation. He's a Black Hawk pilot. And uh, right now he's stationed in Killeen at uh, Fort Hood. And um, he came back from Afghanistan about a year ago and he, he told me some stories that were just incredible. I mean, um, the war is still going on and, and it's really sad um, when, these, when our military personnel are coming home and have to bear some of these memories. It, it's, it's very heartbreaking. So. Uh, I went on this pilgrimage thinking about my son, his next assignment to Germany, which is coming up in September, and he's taken a command of about 250 people. Uh, a huge step for him as he's considering a progression to major. And right now he's a pilot in command, and so when, when I'm on this segment of the walk, I think this is day two. Uh, by the way, uh, uh, Mark, myself, and John, we did 38 miles, Rick and his son, did the 60 miles, so I'm still kind of amazed at that. Incredible, but so, so every segment of the walk, I'm, I'm offering intentions and prayers to different people in my life, and in this segment, it was a quiet segment, we're praying to rosary, and, and I'm thinking about my son, and I decided that I'm gonna catch, I'm gonna go to the lead. And so I pick up my pace, um, and I finally get up there after about, I don't know, 30, 30 minutes, 45 minutes, I finally get up to the front, 
And it, like John describes, it's a bunch of teenagers. And it's like, well, this is typical. <clears throat> so they're leading a pace of about five miles per hour. Everyone else is doing three miles per hour. So uh, they let me carry the cross. And carrying this cross for two miles is, is just a profound experience thinking about, uh, for me, thinking about my son, the, uh, the men and women in uniform protecting uh, our freedoms. Um, you know, we take so much for granted. And I'm also thinking about my dad, who actually served in the Korean War, offering up prayers for him. He's passed now, but I remember the stories that he used to tell us. And of course, my mom, um, you know, she, she is a Filipino, and she would tell us horrendous stories about World War II and the atrocities, you know, that happened in the Philippine Islands during the uh, invasion and the takeover by the Japanese. So, um, so every segment I'm offering prayers and intentions and thinking about families and, you know, Jim captured the behind the scenes stuff that has to happen when you put on something like this. Um, and I'm glad you did that, Jim, because, you know, just like, you know, Running Chirp or any other huge organization, it, it really does take an army to, to rally the volunteers, to get the people, the logistics. You guys saw the logistics, just tra trailering stuff from checkpoint to checkpoint, the food. Uh, there were eight nurses there with a doctor attending to, you know, all of our needs and blisters and dehydration and all that stuff. But what I found um, also kind of incredible is, is the, Kansas, the Kansas women are just so strong. These families, I couldn't believe the number of women and children who actually attended this thing. I thought it was going to be a bunch of guys, but that's not the case at all. Um, and, and I've run marathons and triathlons, but this was hard. Uh, it, it was taxing, not because just of the walk, but after the walk, it's not like you're going to a hotel and relaxing on a bed. You know, you're going to be sleeping on, uh, in a tent. And, um, and, but, but what picks you up, the spirit behind the whole thing is the camaraderie, the people, the volunteers. Just an incredible experience. I really encourage everyone to, to go on this thing. Um, the last thing I want to say is that the, the only thing that really surprised me, um, <clears throat> you know, when I was watching the video series on uh, Father Capen, the, the pilgrimage series. One of the things I really watched a second time was this, uh, I think the series was called Simplicity, Detachment of Things, right? Uh, not letting these things weigh you down. So I'm thinking about that on this journey. And, um, and I had a, a solar powered panel on my backpack and I'm charging phones and I'm, I charge some guy's hearing aid and I'm thinking to myself, I probably should not have brought that, but it was a good thing I did because I'm charging all these guys' cell phones and I did get to ch charge this guy's hearing aids. He, he just lost power. But as we're loading up all our stuff, um, uh, I have a truck and we're loading all the stuff in our pickup truck and Rick and his son are joining us back to Wichita and the truck is full. And I'm thinking about this detachment thing, you know, simplifying. And I look on the ground and I, I see all these bags. And I said, well, who's, whose bags are these? And Rick says, well, those are my bags. And I'm thinking, that's surprising. Hey, you got all this stuff you're bringing on this pilgrimage. Uh, it's, you know, it's, it's a funny story, but it goes back to this thing that, you know, as long as those things don't weigh us down, we keep the focus on where the focus needs to be. We glorify the person, you know, who gave us all these things. That's what should the, the focus should be. So I, I was very fortunate to attend this pilgrimage with, with my brothers. Um, incredible experience, and I hope to do it next year. Well, hello, I'm Mark. 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 Um, right here. Looking not at all inspired or happy or feeling good or just, I'm just ready to be there. And that same feeling you got from a lot of people at the end of the day. First of all, I want to say thanks for everybody here that got me there. And that's the two Johns. They keep it easy. I just say John and somebody, <clears throat> somebody answers. And uh, Jim and um, Rick. Talk about inspiration. We talk about people here, the people are lives and all that. They were my inspiration there, and they still are, just like the rest of the parish. 
I uh, didn't hear about this before, maybe two months ago. And I said, well, being retired, everything's an adventure now, so I'll just jump in and go whenever they happen and whatever happens. So I did, I'm very glad I did. Like everyone else, I thought, all right, this will be kind of a semi, maybe twice as long as I walk a day. I get my little try to aspire to 10,000 steps a day, and I maybe get six. So after the first day looking down there, well, actually the second day, because we, uh, the workers, the workers that support us, retired people, had to work. So uh, it was a great time driving up there with them and going to it and getting there the uh, second day. So we arrived that morning. The first day, my phone said 33,000 steps. I didn't even know it got that far. The second day, 39,000 steps. And that supposedly is 18 miles. But we did, uh, after the first day, we did uh, 13 miles, 18 miles, 8 miles. I got to give credit to Rick and his son, Andrew. Wow, when they, showed, when they were walking that second day and I got done that second day and turned in that first farm, I was feeling like, oh my goodness, this is uh, more than a, a 66 year old going on 67 kind of bargain for here. I did expect it, expectations up there, I did expect it to be more like us. Young men up there that are uh, <laughs> semi-young men up there, kind of a small group doing this pilgrimage. It was a, it was a pretty young crowd. I felt like I was one of the older ones there. So I would not be against maybe just doing one or two or three of the days, but being, you know, it, it's, so I'll divide it into three things. One was the pilgrimage, two was what I call the ceremony of getting there, and three was uh, Father Capon himself, Emil Capon, the Kansans call him. Um, the pilgrimage, pilgrimage itself, um, hard, tiring, inspiring, and then at the end of the day going, Wondering, you know, we got to set up that tent, get everything going, wondering if you're going to make it again. The next, the next morning you go, well, you know, maybe I can. I'll try this out. And you watch all those other people. You watch Rick. You watch the people around you and his son. You watch this family of f four kids? Five. Yeah, five. Five kids. I want to say middle of 30s. The mom, the mom has a pack on the front of her like that with a one-year-old in it walking. The dad's pushing a uh, stroller with another one in it and I think one or two kids walking There's him, walking. three walking, changing diapers along the way, sleeping in a tent at night. So I go <laughs> and there's and they got a faster pace than I do. All four so all four uh, and again younger younger <laughs> people there very inspiring. So that's how you get through it. Bare bones well supported, bare bones supported, but you, you, you make it happen. The second part, the ceremony. Uh, we don't say enough about Father Curtis. I don't know if I have a picture of him up there, but a uh, youngish, I want to say what, mid-30 yeah, priest? Mid kind of made you think of um, Father um, Capon because he is in charge of the school up there. He does this every year. He marched the whole way. He had all the lessons. He held all the masses. And when we turned that pe uh, church at the last day with no showers and just a, a couple of tanks out there to get ready, fully dressed and did the whole mass there. So you got to be inspired by people like that to, as well. And that's what, it, that's what it takes. He had stories along the way every stop. And then we did the mass in the morning. And we did all our... Um, prayers at each stop also. And he was there for everyone all along the way. Um, at the church, beautiful church. Pilsen is a nice little spot there with a beautiful church. Lots of people there, about 300 that were locals. I met a man named Dennis, a farmer there in line where we're ready to eat, who was baptized by Father Capon in 1944. So it brings in a real feeling to you, uh, just being around the people there that all know him and know what's going on. And the last thing I'll say, and you can, questions were, um, again, this is all about uh, Father Emil Capon himself. They're very uh, much in tune with him up there. It's been an ongoing thing. This year is a big year for that, thanks to DNA. And he was found in, uh, his remains found in the unknown. They got some unknown uh, prisoners back at the end of the Korean War. 
So they were in the Punch Bowl in Hawaii. If you ever, anyone, any of you have ever been to the Punch Bowl in Hawaii there, it's a mass uh, Pacific cemetery, military cemetery. And because of DNA, they, they're bringing him here to, to Wichita uh, later this year. So that was the ending uh, part of it. I think there was going to say one other thing about that at the church, but uh, that was very inspiring finish. Again, looking back to how I felt at the end of each day, it was just like, all right, I'm done. I want to just want to sit down, take my shoes off, and uh, be done here. But it was always inspirational at the end, watching other people, having people around you, and then recovering the next day and knowing, you know what? That was a great experience. They do have a, a little uh, museum for Father Capon right next to the church. And even if nothing else, please just go to Pilsen, Kansas, take a look at it, go look at the church, and go to the little museum there. I enjoyed it. I'd like to do it again. And I thank all these people for getting me there. Two more things. These were, the people on this pilgrimage were unbelievably holy people. Like, there were super, these are like Catholics on steroids on this on this walk. Not everybody, but a, a big part of them, the ones that do it every year. So that was awesome to see. I mean, they, the way they talked, the joy in their faces, they, you know, they were smiling the whole time, you know, we're trudging through, trying to make it through. So that was awesome. And then the last thing I'm gonna leave with you, what I really got from it, somebody said this, I don't think it was Father Curtis. It was one of the a witness or something, they said, Father Capon was full of supernatural charity. Not just your normal charity, but supernatural charity. The things he did for his soldiers and, and the people uh, that he was around. And that's what I saw at this, at this, all the people that were helping, I mean, supernatural charity. So that just stuck in my head. And I, I, I that's what being a servant, that's what being a, you know, a servant of God is all about. <music>